From Luke chapter 2, we read these words. In those days, the decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration. It was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. And Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem. Let us see this thing that's taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Friends, this is the good news. This is the the Christmas gospel for us tonight. And as we begin, I'd like to share a story with you, but it's not the story that you would guess. What I'd ask you to do is think about why in the world would this pastor share this story on Christmas? And I'll tell you. It's a story that's been circulating for a number of years, but it seems that during the election of 1860, when Abraham Lincoln was running, he received a letter from a little girl in the Midwest, an eight-year-old child. This sincere and well-meaning little girl sent him a suggestion for his campaign. She suggested, Mr. Lincoln, if you really want to get elected, I think you ought to grow a beard to cover your, whole, your homely face. That's what she said, and maybe not those words, but we, I think you ought to grow a beard to cover your homely face if you really think you're going to get elected. And rather being, than being offended by this, uh, Mr. Lincoln really was appreciative of the little girl's honesty, and he wrote her back a personal letter. He thanked her for her suggestion, and then he added that later in the year, his campaign train would be going through her her town in the Midwest, and so he suggested that maybe they meet that day. Now listen to this. When the child's father got wind of this, he was ecstatic, because he was a member of Lincoln's Republican Party, and the thought of meeting a presidential candidate... This, this was more than he could ever hope for. And he had visions of special favors and political prestige and, and maybe even a, a cabinet position in Lincoln's uh, administration. And so the little girl's father arranged for a brass band to come and play on that day and all sorts of political speeches from some of the big mucky mucks in the party. And when the day of Lincoln's arrival finally came, The entire county was gathered out there on that railroad station. They were all waiting with bated breath to meet Mr. Lincoln. And it was all the powerful and prestigious citizens on that platform. They were anxious to be able to see a president-to-be face-to-face. Everybody was there that day, listen to this, except the little eight-year-old girl that Lincoln had written to. You see, her father had left her home, reasoning that Honest Abe would much rather spend time with with, uh, important political and civic leaders than some little girl. Why would he waste his time on a child? But it just so happened that day that as the train was pulling closer and closer to this little girl's town, the train experienced a breakdown. 
and they were forced to stop about a mile before they reached the town. And so rather than sit on a railroad car on a hot, muggy day, Abraham Lincoln got up and decided that he would walk across the field and walk into town on his own to find this little girl. When he arrived in town, as you might imagine, it was just about deserted because everybody was where? Out at the railroad station waiting to meet Abe Lincoln. Well, he found the child's house, and as he knocked on the door, there was a wide-eyed maid that couldn't believe who was standing there on their doorstep. She ushered Mr. Lincoln to the backyard where this little girl was hosting a tea party for all the other eight-year-olds in the neighborhood. And then for the next half hour, Abraham Lincoln sat on a playhouse furniture chair, balancing a child's teacup on his knee and small-talking with little children. And a while later, maybe a half hour, maybe an hour later, he walked back to his train that had just been repaired, and the locomotive fired up the steam engine, and it sped ahead. Now listen to this. It sped ahead right past the railroad station, right past the, the, the brass band that was playing and the, and the flag-draped platform, right, right past all those finely dressed ladies and gentlemen, right past all the distinguished and political dignitaries. And as it went by, they were wide-eyed and they were confounded of why would he not stop? Why would he pass us by? But think with me, folks. Apparently, this soon-to-be President Lincoln was not as interested in hanging around the big mucky-mucks of his time as he was with spending time with the humble, the small, and the childlike. And I realize this is a rather unusual story to tell on Christmas Eve. But will you stop and think about this story with me? Because in many ways, this is very much like the Christmas gospel we've just read, isn't it? When the only Son of God came to this earth on that holy night, you might expect that he would be greeted by who? Kings and princes and rulers from all over the world. You and I might expect that the very king of all kings would would expect pomp and circumstance and all sorts of fanfare. You and I might expect that the Son of God showing up on this earth in flesh incarnate would surround himself with the rich and the powerful and the prestigious, like all those people that were standing on the uh, the, the train platform there in 1860. But you see, the Christmas story is about surprises, isn't it? Whenever God tells a story, it always catches us off guard. It always shows us that the tables are turned on the values of the world. And lo and behold, when the Son of God shows up, He doesn't arrive in a palace, as you and I would have guessed, but rather He arrives in an animal stable, in that manger. And the first guests that are invited to come and visit and greet this this little child are not ambassadors and VIPs and dignitaries, but it's who? It's those shepherds, common, humble, lowly, less than average shepherds. Now listen, how many people have ever received a Christmas card with a picture of a shepherd on it? I realize when we look at those pictures, it always seems that shepherds must have been very noble, stately, serene looking people. But I'm here to tell you tonight, we know from history, that was not the reputation that shepherds had. Shepherds were viewed by most people of that day as a motley bunch, as very undistinguished, undesirable characters who didn't smell much better than the sheep that they were tending and really weren't a whole lot smarter than the sheep that they were tending. This is true. In those days, a Jewish rabbi would declare a shepherd unclean. Why? Because they were always walking through the droppings of the sheep. They were unclean. In those days, a Roman court of law refused to accept the testimony of a shepherd in a court of law. Why? Because of their questionable character and their questionable reputation. And in those days, the average traveler who saw a shepherd out with his sheep would always make a big loop around them so they didn't come too close. And why? Because shepherds had a reputation of taking things that didn't belong to them, if you know what I mean. They were kind of like pickpockets and thieves. Now think with me. If all this is true, why in the world would God place shepherds at the top of the guest list? Why would they be the first ones chosen to come and see the Christ child? 
Why would the heavenly host come and announce his, his birth to these people? I mean, after all, weren't there a little more high-class people that could have been invited, people that are a little more respectable? What about Caesar Augustus? What about Quirinius of Syria? What about Herod the Great? Why didn't God bother to invite these bigwigs to come and be a part of the coming of the Son of God? Why did they get ignored? You might say, why were they standing on that train station for a train that was going to pass right by them? Do you think, friends, that it's safe to say God has never been impressed or partial to the rich and famous? God has never been impressed or partial to the proud and the pompous or the high and mighty. But rather, God's guest list for people is a whole lot different than the list that most of us would have put together. And yes, the Son of God came to seek and save all people. But from this story, it certainly seems that God has a special place in His heart. For who? Common people. People that need hope and healing. People that are willing to admit their weaknesses and their problems, people that may be alienated or discriminated against, people that may be physically challenged or are struggling financially, or people that are lost spiritually. I tell you again, the Christ child came for sinners, for the rowdy, for the rough and tumble, not for the finely put together people of this world. See, these were the people that didn't need to be convinced that they were less than perfect. These were people that realized they were less than what they were created to be. And they were not afraid to admit that they had needs. They, they had things to confess. These are the people that the Christ child came into this world, came down from heaven to appeal to, to die for. These are the people that God invites on such a night. These are the people that Christmas is meant for. And the question I need to ask each of us tonight is this. Are we these kinds of people? Or sometimes are we too and high and mighty? Maybe sometimes too a little proud and pompous. In a magazine article years ago, Harriet Ritchie told the story of an incident that, that she and her family had uh, one Christmas that helped her see Christmas and understand the Christmas gospel in a whole new light. She said, the family had been out for a midnight service, something like this. And on their way home, they decided that they would stop for an early morning breakfast. But at that time, the only place they could find open was a truck stop out on the interstate. And as they pulled into the truck stop, there were a few big diesels revving their engines outside. And inside were, were truckers that were drinking coffee. And there was a jukebox playing, as, as Harriet would say, some bad country music. Songs about cheating hearts and, and all that goes with uh, country. But anyway, Harriet said, the neon lights in the window were old and they were gaudy and the place smelled like bacon grease and cigarette smoke. She said behind the counter there was a one-armed man flipping eggs on a skillet. And then a large waitress came out with a, a tray of water and then in another hand she had a number of menus. Harriet went on to say, she looked around this place on this day, on this early morning, and thought herself to be an out-of-place snob. Because she and her family had just come from a beautiful church and pretty soon they would be heading back to their picture-perfect home in an upper-middle-class neighborhood of Atlanta, Georgia. And she thought most of the people in this place would not be heading to a place as if they were going to. And she thought that maybe someday the family would look back on this moment and they'd laugh about it. They'd say, remember that night we stopped after Christmas services at that gaudy truck stop with that god-awful music and all those tacky lights? And then she said she looked out the window and there was a VW van that pulled in. And as it stopped, there was a young man that got out. He had a shaved head and, and a big bushy beard and tattoos up and down his arms and, and jeans on. He walked to the other side of the van and opened the door for a young woman to, who, to get out. And she was carrying a, a small little child. And then this, this fairly scruffy family made their way into the truck stop. They sat down just a couple booths away from Harriet's family. And when the waitress came and took their order, suddenly the baby began screaming. And neither of these young parents seemed to be able to, to change that or do anything about it. So the waitress, the big waitress that met them at the door, came over and put her hands out as an invitation. 
She said to these, this couple, sit down, kids, sit down and drink your coffee. Let me see if I can do anything with that child. And with that, it was evident that she had handled a baby or two in her life. And she picked up the child and she walked around the truck stop and she was bouncing the child and patting the child and kind of cooing with the child. And she'd take the baby over to the truckers that were there drinking their coffee and pretty much all of them would either make faces at the kid or, or whistle or coo or do something. And after a while, she was able to stop the baby from screaming because he saw the flashing lights at the jukebox. And just then, she brought the baby over to Harriet's table. She said, look at this little one. Look at this little darling. My kids are so big. They've grown up. I forgot what it was like to have a little one like this. And it was just then that the one-armed man that had been flipping the eggs behind came out and he poured some coffee for the family there at the booth. And it was then that Harriet's eyes filled with tears. Her husband looked over at her, he asked, what's, what's the matter? She said, nothing, just, just Christmas. And then she reached into her purse and pulled out a Kleenex to wipe her eyes, and she pulled out some coins, and she gave them to her kids and said, why don't you kids go to the jukebox and put some Christmas music on, please? But as they went, then she looked at her husband and said, he would have come here, wouldn't he? He would have come here. Her husband said, who? Who would have come here? She said, Jesus. If Jesus had been born in this city on this night and he had a choice of showing up at our church or our neighborhood or this place, he'd be here, wouldn't he? He'd be here with these people. Her husband didn't answer for a while. He paused for a moment to think about what he was going to say. And after a while, he came back and said, yeah, you're right. This is where, this is where he'd be born, either here or a homeless shelter. And Harriet then said, that's what bothers me about this. When we got here, I was feeling sorry for these people because they probably weren't going to go home so, to neighborhoods as nice as ours. And with this awful music, they probably have never heard of Handel's Messiah. But now I think this is the place where the real Christmas is taking place. And Harriet said, and I don't belong. We're the ones to be pitied. What do you think about that? We're the ones to be pitied. Harriet's husband put an arm around her shoulder and said, Now listen, remember what the angel said. I come to bring good news of great joy for all people. But Harriet said she had come to see and understand Christmas and what Jesus Christ came for in a whole new way that night. Her heart was changed. And maybe, friends, if you and I are not too cold-hearted or hard-hearted, maybe we can come to see it in a different way tonight as well. Here we can come to understand the beauty, the simplicity, the love, the grace, the mercy of this story. We can come and see why and how God came to reveal his heart on Christmas and what Christmas was really about. Friends, on this holy night, think with me again. The God of the universe came down to show his love and his commitment, not just for some people, but for all people. Not just for the high and mighty or the, the, the high achievers or the comfortable or the affluent or the respectable. Not just for the rich and the famous, but all people. Lowly people. Humble people. Especially the humble people. People like us. I don't know. May God give us all the hearts and the minds and the humility tonight to once again receive this Christ child that's come to us. Let's pray. Oh Lord, again we pray, what a wonder and a mystery it all is. That you would break our stereotypes, that you would do the unexpected, that you would surprise us and surprise the entire human race, reaching out to people that were often forgotten and overlooked, that you would put them at the very top of your guest list. Lord, continue to teach us your values. Help us to see the world and one another through your eyes. And may we never think of ourselves or, or believe ourselves to be too self-sufficient, too proud or pompous, too high and mighty. God, keep us humble people, as difficult as that is to pray. And keep us in your heart. All these things we ask on this night. And all the children of God tonight together say, Amen. Amen.